Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another webinar sponsored by your dog's friend. Today's webinar, Why Is My Dog Like This and What Can I Do About It Now, is being presented by Dr. Esther Eng, a clinical behavior resident with Dr. Amy Pike's Animal Behavior Wellness Center in Fairfax, Virginia, where she sees pets with a variety of behavior disorders that range from mild fears to extreme aggression, compulsive disorders, and panic disorders. Dr. Eng will be joined today by veterinary behaviorist, Dr. Amy Learn, Chief of Clinical Behavioral Medicine at the Animal Behavior Wellness Center's Richmond, Virginia branch. Dr. Learn will monitor chat and answer some questions there during the webinar. Dr. Eng will answer more questions at the end. These webinars are largely made possible through your donations. So if you are inclined to donate, you can go to our homepage, yourdogsfriend.org, and in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see an icon for donating. I know that we will all learn a lot today. Now over to you, Dr. Eng. Oh, well, thank you, Deborah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hyung Ng, um, technically, as you see on the slide, but like Deborah said, I go by Esther, and I am. I'm the clinical behavior resident under Dr. Amy Pike's mentorship at the Fairfax campus of the Animal Behavior Wellness Center. And today's topic is why is my dog like this and what can I do about it now? So let's get into it. So today's webinar is actually going to be divided into those two sections. The first half is going to be the why of what, why did my become, dog become like this, excuse me, and then what do I do about it? So we'll cover factors that contribute to behaviors before birth, um, during that socialization window that everyone's probably quite familiar with, um, some of our past experiences and current ones. Then we'll discuss the multimodal form of addressing behavioral issues in our dogs. So cute little terrier. Why? Why am I like this, mom? Dad. <laughs> um, remember that for before birth characteristics such as genetics, um, we have bred specific characteristics into our dogs, such as herding behavior, which if you've had a herding dog, you know, they can nip or stare or chase um, guarding dogs, retrieving dogs, hunting dogs. You know, we've we've bred certain characteristics into our breeds um, so that those characteristics don't really go away. We do know that things like fearfulness or shyness do tend to have a high level of heritability. And similarly, we can see trends like the ability to train, like how easy is a dog to train or, or boldness related to those breed predispositions. I always use my own dogs and my own experiences as examples. And um, one of the times Dr. Pike's Airedale, uh, which is a type of terrier, um, Ginny, and my own dog, who's a golden retriever, Pearl, they were playing. And the first time that we introduced them, you could clearly see a very different way that they were interacting with each other for the first time. The terrier was more like, hi, I'm here and this is me. Um, whereas the golden retriever was like, oh, hey, hi, this is me. You know, so just as we might see some inherent characteristics like that, we have bred those into our dogs, right? Um, so just remember that about genetics. When it comes to actual, like, genes, there's not really an aggression gene. Um, instead, it's probably more that a gene is actually going to be that code and that codes for proteins and they interact with the function of our serotonin. So if you can remember, serotonin is our coping mechanism um, and 
you'll have various levels of that per individual. Um, and therefore, just as you would with any disease process, um, it is a whole body and whole environmental, all of that interacts together. So again, we don't have a gene, there is no specific gene that just translates directly to I'm going to be XYZ behavior dog. Um, it's an all around interaction. And there's even variable effects in those types of expression. So think about um, if any of you are familiar with von Willebrand's disease and Doberman's, there isn't just I have von Willebrand's and therefore I can't clot my blood. There is a, a varying ability of ability to clot blood in those dogs. Um, so that's kind of more how we want to think about genetics. And um, the other factors for before the dog is even born is that time in utero. So studies show us that a single female puppy that is in an all male litter are more prone to anxiety. Um, and even the fact of working ability in our canines tends to come from the mother. So you want to look at the behaviors of the mother if you're thinking about breeding a dog for its working ability. Now for cats, interestingly enough, the friendliness factor actually comes from dad. Um, so there are certain things that we can try to follow as trends in our genetics, but it's overall kind of broad categories and, and more, you know, characteristics and personalities, not a specific gene that translates directly to aggression um, or anxiety. Uh, we also want to consider the role of mom, right? So providing mom um, with a really nice environment and taking into consideration her level of stress. Right? We know even for people, um, we want to make sure mama's stress stays lower, especially as we're going further and further into that pregnancy. Um, so we want we we do that for people. We, we want to do that for our dogs as well. Um, and then the nourishment that mama may have had during her pregnancy, also even the number of puppies that she's carrying there, right? You can only eat so much um, as an individual. But if you think about nourishment and how we, we know all of that goes directly to our babies. And so if you think about a stray on the streets um, and she is stressed, clearly, right? She might be running and like scared of people. Um, and then her level of nutrition, how well did she get everything she needed to provide the correct nutrition for that brain development in her puppies. Um, so those factors can definitely affect behavior in our dogs. Now, maternal behavior, and that's a little bit right after they're born, um, is also important. So we also find that dogs and cats that have been been deprived of maternal and peer interactions, they form poorer social bonds later in life. If you can think of if anyone's ever fostered like a little baby kitten or bottle raised any puppies, um, you're quite familiar. <laughs> if a puppy is removed from their litter at birth or hand raised, um, they might not be able to take care of its own puppies or mate later in life. Some of those puppies tend to have more aggressive tendencies or anxious tendencies. Um, and their ability to handle social situations. A lot of them are a little bit socially abnormal when it comes to their interactions with people, but also with their own species, whether it's dog or cat. So the what happens before and shortly after birth can definitely impact behavior later in life. Let me get to our next slide. Um, so then we want to talk about those stages, right? We've got that neonatal stage is from birth to about 13 days. And then our transitional stage, as we call it, is the 13 to 19 day range. Socialization is that 19 day to 12 week period. Um, and that's what we'll delve into. And then juvenile period is about 12 weeks to sexual maturity. And we'll say that the adult stage is from sexual maturity and on. Now, a note that I wrote here at the bottom of my slide is, you know, the beginning and end of each phase isn't exact like days and it doesn't have to be so precise, um, but it's that progression. You know that there's that general progression and order of things that relates to what is actually physically developing in their bodies. Um, a lot of times to just make it easier for us, um, we'll say that our transitional period is, you know, the, the 13 to 19, and then our socialization is the 19 to 12 weeks. So um, 
that that's the numbers that you probably want to. Uh, oh, excuse me. My mouse decided to go a little crazy. Okay. So further into that socialization window that we're talking about, um, the, the beginning of this period, a puppy starts to respond to like sights and sounds of people and animals um, that might be more at a distance. Um, and those behaviors then change to like, I'm gonna be more willing to approach novel objects and moving stimuli um, and that therefore it's really important. That's a really critical time for our dogs. This is when social relationships are established. And also on the other end of the spectrum, that's also when the puppies become more sensitive to areas of physiological, excuse me, psychological stress because all those physical characteristics have developed. Um, so I always talk to my clients when I was in general practice about like, think about, you know, a little wolf pup who initially is really in that cave and stays close to mom during those early developmental times because they don't have the skills and ability to like go out and fend for themselves. But then soon they start, uh, start to explore. Even our human babies do that, right? So um, that is when we might start to develop attachments to to like our own because we can respond to different situations um, and we can take in all these different stimuli. Um, then they might also start to like say, I'm okay with certain stimuli that I've experienced because I, I had some good experiences with those stimuli. Um, and so that area and that time is usually where we encourage our owners a lot to say, this is the time we want you to make sure that, you know, your dog gets lots of great experiences. Um, now, it doesn't always have to be the number of experiences that we focus on. Yes, the be more the better, um, but we really want to focus on the positive aspect of that. And if we do happen to go a little more than what our dogs can handle, then let's reintroduce them at a lower level of intensity so that they can kind of come up and explore on their own and say, oh, like, okay, that, that blow dryer is not as bad as I thought, um, or, oh, okay, it's okay that they touch me on my paw because it, it doesn't hurt me. Um, you know, take it slow and gentle and make sure it's a, it's a positive experience that our dogs are going to have. Um, so then our next section that we want to think about for how dogs can be you know, the, why their behaviors are, are our experiences just as people do. So um, we talk a lot about types and techniques of training uh, for our clients at the wellness center. Um, and then even trauma experiences. Um, if you think about traumatic experiences uh, from our own lives, that definitely impacts then from there on how we feel about other stimuli later. So the, there are there are instances of PTSD in our canine patients, and Dr. Pike did a webinar about that before with your dog's friends, so make sure to listen into that one if you're interested. Um, but then also I want us to not just focus on what we assessed as trauma or not, because sometimes you might think like, but it was a bath. That, there's nothing traumatic about that, but it really does need to be from the perspective of the dog, right? So in our minds, we thought, well, I'm just giving the dirty puppy a bath. But if the dog thought, oh gosh, like I'm slipping in my bathtub and I feel insecure and the water was this weird temperature and I don't like the smell of this shampoo, you know, there were a lot of things that came on quite quickly. And yes, it might've only lasted 20, 10, 20 minutes, but to them, it wasn't a great experience. So thinking about it from the perspective of our dogs can also be important. Um, and then touching on training a little bit, the past experiences that I tend to see a lot of times, and the crew here is probably different, our demographics who tuned into your dog's friend. Um, but um, in my job every day, I hear a lot of times, well, I, I went to this professional trainer and they told me that I should use uh, this, you know, e-collar and that's how I'm supposed to communicate with them. And um, it's a it's a shot collar. The E stands for electronic, right? Or a prong collar or a choke chain. Um, and we've seen those happen a lot and it, it comes up in training history, but we want to focus on, um, you know, actually when we use those methods, unfortunately in any situation, what is learned and that learning is determined by the learner. So um, a key factor for those methods is that we may think that, again, we're 
we're pressing that button for that shot collar or we're pulling on the leash and saying, let's go this other way. Um, and that we think we're being quite clear because we know what we're seeing and we know what we're trying to communicate to our dog. But again, learning is determined by that learner. And as a learner, if my dog actually saw a young kid on a skateboard roll by at the same time that I said, let's go this way. And I thought I was protecting my dog from a different dog coming down, but my dog actually saw it as, oh, the kid went by. Well, then did I start to create a negative association with the child or the skateboard, right? So we we can't control that. And we do want to focus on more positive reinforcement techniques when it comes to training for our dogs. So next, we want to think about what they're also going through right now. Um, a big part of that is the medical component um, and pain, which it, comes under that umbrella. So here I have an example of Digitherm Imaging. It's a thermal imaging device that we offer at the Wellness Center. Um, and so if you take the example here, if you can see my mouse, um, the little image all the way on the left that has kind of that purple-ish background, there is a little circle <laughs> around the knee. Um, and you can see that, you know, that whiter space in the middle of the red um, is present at that knee. Now it's also present in the next image in the middle with the black background, but you can clearly tell that there is a, a larger area of that white space and um, take note of the circles in those areas. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, the other view is from the back of the dog. So um, we're kind of seeing like that, but end view. Um, but it, it, this was a great image. It's of the same dog. You can see that the left side knee is more of that greenish bluish coloration versus the right side has more of that red white. Um, and so when we take these images, we have our, our patients stand in certain positions and, you know, click through with the thermal imaging camera, and then we can generate a report. So not only do we get these images, but we can assess the thermal temperature of that region. And what we're really looking for is asymmetry. So there are times when an area might be more blue cold and indicate like denervation. Um, so that would be like neurologic disease that could cause changes in our dog's behavior. But also the red white is usually what we see more commonly. And that typically indicates you know, more blood flow, which could be, you know, pain or inflammation. And so when we take those images, the reason I said, remember the little circles around the knees on those first two images is because the report can help us generate the average temperature within those little circles that we've created. And if the average temperature is about one degree Fahrenheit or greater difference, then we know that there is significant enough change in one side or the other. And that therefore tells us, okay, we need to investigate this further. Does that mean I ask you to go to your primary care veterinarian and get some x-rays? Um, does it mean that you should go to an orthopedic surgeon and get a consult from them? Which um, There's other advanced imaging that can happen. So you can think of Digitherm as a screening tool. A lot of times our patients, we can't touch them. <laughs> so it's helpful if we can have some sort of imaging to say, hey, there is evidence that something is different here and we should investigate it further. Um, I explain to people very commonly, I am a chronic migraine sufferer. And on days where my migraines are exceptionally bad, I am going to have a shorter temper <laughs> than on days where it's kind of average. Um, so then that leads us into our concept of trigger stacking. And that's the graphic all the way to the right. So that red line at 100% indicates the threshold that every person and every dog is going to have. Um, that if you're below that threshold, okay, I might be stressed, but I can kind of cope and deal with the things that are happening versus I go past that red line and it's just reactive, responsive emotion. That's what's happening, right? So again, if we use my migraine example, um, I might be someone who starts more at like the 25, 40% on a day-to-day -day basis. And as the day progresses, 
more and more things that are stressors to me add on top. So, okay, I started off at 25 and then I came in and my key wasn't working. Oh gosh, I can't get in the door. All right, I can deal with that because I'm still below my red line, right? But then later I get an email and someone, one of my patients bit another dog or person. Oh gosh, that's that's hard and that's difficult. So that adds to my stress. And as the day progresses, I'm really close to that red line. And so by the end of the day, I get home and my poor husband has no idea. And he says, Esther, what what do you want for dinner? And he asked me this before I left in the morning. And I said, it's fine. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out later. Um, But then I'm really close to that red line now because all my triggers have stacked on throughout the day and I have a lot less space and ability to cope. So when he asks me something, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't know. Let's just order, figure it out. Okay. Um, same question as earlier in the day, but I was able to cope with it a lot better um, now that I have this underlying pain and all these triggers that stacked on each other. Um, that might be why sometimes our dogs tend to have harder times also in the evening. So that is the concept of trigger stacking. And that can also explain why our dogs might behave differently during different times of day, different times of the month, if they have like seasonal allergies, um, or if they're getting older, or if there's certain stairs, you can you can probably think of all the things for your own dog and how those concepts could apply. So that is why um, we do recommend going to your primary care veterinarian um, to get some help. And we'll talk about that soon about what do we do now. So current experiences, past experiences, and all those, you know, genetic things that we just discussed. So then we're going to talk about, all right, well, we figured out here are some reasons why our dogs behave the way they do. That's great. <laughs> what, what can I do about it now? So that is where we're, we're, we might go in a little bit of a backwards order from the way that the first half was presented. So remember we said, hey, you know, if you have underlying discomfort, I highly recommend that you reach out to your veterinarian. So in the behavior world, we have a common saying that if there's a sudden change, if your dog all of a sudden is doing something different, then it's medical until proven otherwise. So um, I do appreciate our primary care veterinary community as they they can do it all right um what doctor can you go to who does dentistry and x-rays and ultrasound take care of your you know reproductive needs as well as your orthopedic needs like that doesn't happen in human medicine but our vets are amazing so just kudos to them um but really they're going to be able to do things such as that really important physical exam maybe some x-rays blood work including guess getting like uh cortisol levels which is our stress hormone um thyroid values, um, specific testing of the blood for like GI disease, um, again, ultrasound of the abdomen, you can, you name it, and most places can do that for you. And if they can't, then they will refer you to maybe someone like an internal medicine specialist who can then work your dog up to the degree that is appropriate. Um, we just want to ensure that again, anything new <laughs> is medical and to approve and otherwise. So you got to check off all those boxes, make sure it's not anything new medical that has come up in your dog to explain a new behavior. So then we talk about management. So management really, um, if you think about previously, we said, hey, there's all these triggers that we might have stacked on each other. And we've had history, right? Whether it's learning history or trauma, um, we need to identify those things because then we can manage those triggers to the best of our ability. Um, but the reason we want to manage things is that that prevents the practice of our problematic behaviors. Oh, my dog is barking every time the Amazon truck comes by. Okay, well, can we put up some window film? We'll show you some pictures of some strategies really soon. But what can we do to help set your dog up for success, essentially, and manage those triggers? My dog's really scared of thunderstorms. Okay, can we use some white or brown noise? Can we use music? There are ways we can do that. Um, The management also helps us to hopefully avoid further incidences of those triggers, like we said, um, and then provide for some sooner safety in the cases of, like, if my dog is harming 
his or herself, or if my dog is potentially dangerous to others. So um, that's what, where management can be helpful. Um, and then because we're avoiding the trigger and we're trying to prevent practicing being, you know, in that problem behavior, um, that can help to decrease our pet's overall stress and arousal level. And like I said, set them up hopefully more for success, practicing the successful things. Um, so a few examples that we have here. Um, so everyone is probably familiar with muzzles for dogs. We tend to see the kind of nylon muzzles used in like grooming or veterinary settings. Um, in behavior world, we tend to more so recommend the ones that look like the top two. So the black one at the upper left corner is a Baskerville muzzle. And then the one on the upper right, the tan one is a Italian style muzzle. Um, they are available just, you know, on Amazon or from the actual manufacturers, and we do prefer a basket muzzle. Um, so you can see it's got those openings so the dog can still take treats. They can actually very surprisingly can still drink water through these. Um, and a, a big thing is I want them to have enough space from, I'll turn to the side, um, from like the nose and like the bottom of their jaw, like the muzzle should have enough space that they can still like open mouth pant um, because we want them to still be able to do those functions in these types of muzzles. So that's why we prefer that basket muzzles versus those nylon types. Um, and it is a process. We do need to help them to get accustomed to these tools. Um, there's, you can see that there's also a um, gentle leader, that green nylon <laughs> looking device on that uh, really cute dog in the upper right corner. Um, and again, this is a tool. It's a management strategy. You could also find devices to help cover their eyes or maybe their ears if they're stimuli or visual or auditory. Um, and then, of, of course, in the bottom half of the slide, you see different kind of more containment <laughs> techniques. And there are some dogs who, you know, have issue with confinement. So this is to your discretion. Um, but, you know, crate training, hope, highly always recommend that. Um, and then using those gates, those baby gates, um, and there's so many different types, um, but using that as a way to create that actual physical barrier um, to help protect them and, and the other person or dog from your dog, maybe ways that you want to consider. Um, I always joke, <laughs> everyone always thinks about, let me put my dog away. Sometimes that's not always possible. And it might actually be, let's create a play space for our children <laughs> instead. Um, so that's that lower left corner. You can see the kids are smiling <laughs> um, and they're still having a good time and, and providing them a safe space for them to interact. Um, whereas the dog might be the one who now gets some time out and loose is an option as well. So don't, don't think it always has to be your dog. So regarding management, I already mentioned a little bit about window film and the white noise. If you have a dog that is noise sensitive, a lot of times layering sounds can be helpful. So that white brown noise, you might have that playing with the device or YouTube playlist. Um, and then the music, the types that we found are helpful are classical and reggae. I know everyone's familiar with classical being the type of reggae um, is also apparently quite soothing for our dogs. Um, I think it's the rhythm, like it's more like they can groove to it and it's calming. Um, and then you'll notice nowadays the newer albums of Through a Dog's Ear, which is a, a great product, um, has a mix of classical and reggae if you so choose. Um, so avoidance of those locations and outings and things that might be hard, like really hard for your dog, that actually is okay. Sometimes we have to accept and grieve that maybe the dog isn't able to do the things we had hoped for, but if I will use my husband, don't tell him, but he's quite introverted. And so if I were to say to him every weekend, like, hey, let's go do all these things, like that might actually really stress him out. <laughs> um, and so if I have a dog who is innately more in introverted and he or she wants to not really go to the winery and socialize with everybody, that's okay. We can think about other ways to interact with our dog that's enjoyable for both parties. Um, if you have a dog who wants to, ingest things or, you know, guard things. Okay, try our best, right? I know 
management can fail, but let's pick those items up. Um, even avoiding certain tasks, like uh, my dog, as much as I tried, <laughs> excuse me, my mic, uh, as much as I tried, she doesn't like her paws touched. So her nails, I'll admit, are a little longer than they should be. Um, but those husbandry tasks that they're like actively showing you avoidance, okay, can we find other ways to address that in a cooperative manner where we teach them maybe to like grind their um, nails instead or file them down? Or, or do we need to think about like, if I have a really fluffy dog and grooming is a horrible experience, do I need to give them something medication wise um, to help calm them for that experience and not avoid, but, excuse me, avoid it at home? Think about that. And then advertising your management. So you see that red harness says, do not pet. Um, and sometimes people will still not pay attention to this. Um, but if as much as possible, there's even those leash covers or um, like harness covers that have the label like nervous dog or, you know, things like that, that might be something to consider so that hopefully visually people can see from a distance like, oh, maybe I shouldn't go pet that particular dog today. Um, and then even signs like at our doors and um, like maybe try to make it humorous, like the one I've included here, um, to say like, hey, I, I, I get you're here, but text me, um, you don't have to knock or ring the doorbell, um, and managing it with some advertisement can never hurt. So that is a technique as well. And then, like I mentioned, through a dog's ear is that image um, that you see is one of the albums. Um, they've created music for dogs to be calming. Of course, there's a lot of Spotify and YouTube playlists that you can consider as well. Um, and then the window film is what I've put an example of. It's literally just an image from Amazon. <laughs> um, where you can stick something on and I put in the one that's more like blocking visually, because um, that's what we want to aim for, for our dogs. So remember that it's not a replacement for our training. And sometimes our tools, such as like that gentle leader or the basket nozzle, do actually take some level of training. I think, unfortunately, we see other dogs do well with them. So we think, oh, I can just put it on my dog. And then they develop like an aversive connection to this thing that's on their face. And we don't want that for them. We want it to be a slow, gradual process of something that's fitted for them and they only associate it with really great things and then that way you have it so that if we really need it for another situation it's ready to go and they have these really good associations with it um I know a lot of times some uh, dogs that we've trained well, we have their basket muzzle, we bring it out, they're wiggly and waggy and they're excited because they know good things are going to come such as good treats or you know play together and they or walk and they actually come and shove their nose, you know, voluntarily in there. And that's, that's the degree that we want it to be before we need to use it for like going to the vet or going to the groomer. And then after we use it for those situations, we want to make sure to like give them good experiences with it again. So we don't just poison that tool later on. Um, so I think that some cases and some dogs, again, I'm, this is a broad presentation, but um, sometimes using management can be enough to help with whatever behavior your, your dog may be exhibiting. Um, but we want to make sure that we reach out to your veterinarian and the extra help if needed to help with these areas. Now, next, we want to also talk about modification of behavior. So remember, we had talked about the types of training that are out there. Um, and later, I am actually going to leave up my, on my screen um, a really good chart that I stole from the, I think it was the Baltimore Humane Society. <laughs> um, it has an acronym, a list of acronyms of all the qualifications that a trainer may have. And just as you may look like when you go to your own doctor or any sort of professional, you look at like, okay, this person has an MBA. Okay, this person is a DVM. We look at those initials and we know that it means something. There's a certain level of knowledge that they have amassed and they've taken tests so that they can say, I am a proven professional in this field. Um, unfortunately, training is such an unregulated industry that, you know, anyone can make a website and say, well, I'm, I'm an expert. I'm a behavioral trainer. Um, and then you look in their website and nowhere did they mention any credentials or anything like that. So I, I will leave that chart up so that you can you know, snap a picture or take down some notes so that you can start looking, look at those websites. They should very proudly be advertising 
what certifications that they have as a trainer. And if I don't see anything, a lot of times that's a red flag for me. So look for that. But essentially, these types of trainers should be able to help with behavior modification. Um, I think of behavior modification training as a little different than like your basic obedience. So um, an example I use all the time is, you know, training like sit, stay might be more like, okay, we're going to learn one, two, three, four, five, right? Uh, whereas like behavior modification, we want to help them change their emotion to those triggers. Like you go to your therapist and you learn to count, take a deep breath, one, two, three. And that's a, a, a little bit of a difference. There are still numbers, but we're using them differently. Um, and then the chart here means if I am really struggling with a trigger, say, my dog doesn't like other dogs, right? Then we have to think about these factors like what is the intensity of my reaction? What is the threshold of distance that my dog can tolerate? And for how long should I be expected to deal with this trigger? If I can't deal with any of these things, maybe I need to adjust one part of that triangle so that I can set my dog up for success and decrease the practice of her reactivity to another dog. So again, this is a really great chart um, that is also easily available online. Um, so let's then talk about um, medications and products. So we tend to use these for our dogs when there is fear or anxiety or stress as like the base of why we're doing our behaviors, which is pretty much most of the time. <laughs> um, and so those times are when we might reach for actual like anxiolytic products. Now, if a behavior can't just be managed with those management strategies that we discussed, that's also a factor for medication. And we never use just medication or a supplement without the others, such as behavior modification and management of our triggers. So I'm never going to ask someone to just start giving a medication and say, that's your magic pill you're going to be great. Here you go. Um, I, we do need to discuss like, okay, in your own home, how do we have to manage the situation so they don't practice things? Um, and then what can we do to change their emotional response to their triggers? Many times though, we need additional products to help them get and stay below that red line of threshold that we talked about. Um, so let's go into some of these. Um, Oh, let me also explain to you, because this is also a common question that I get is, um, you know, what is the goal? Like, why do I need these things? Um, see the stars used in conjunction with behavior modification and training. But the goal is, okay, let me decrease the intensity of my behavior. So if we use our reactive dog as an example, again, okay, if, if before I was really lunging and barking and hackles up and really reactive to any and every dog that I saw, then can I decrease that intensity? I'm still uncomfortable with that dog, but can I this time look at dog and acknowledge that it happened? No, but mom has a wonderful treat and yay, we can go in the opposite direction. Um, frequency of behavior, I want them that to come down as well. So if it used to be every single dog in person that my dog can't deal with, okay, does it then start to gradually become every other dog? And then every second dog, you know, what I want the frequency to come down as well as the time of recovery. Recovery is that period right after we've encountered our trigger and now I'm really on edge, but how long does it take me to come back down so that I can use my brain again? And we want that recovery time to improve. Um, the types of medications that we use commonly are uh, in two big categories. One is a daily medication. It therefore by definition is given every day. Um, and those tend to take a longer time before you can see its beneficial effects. Um, and that's because of how they work and they need to really work in your brain for at least about six to eight weeks before you're going to start to see the benefits. Then the other category is an event medication. Those, as we described, are prior to your stressful events, specifically like your grooming appointment or going to the vet. Um, and so those tend to work faster. Usually the shortest one takes about like 90 to 120 minutes and then maybe up to a few hours, depending on which medication you're using. But they also wear off faster. So um, they tend to wear off in about like six to eight, maybe 12 hours, again, depending on the medication. So those are our 
broader categories of medication. Um, I will say that our, our goal also with our daily medications or it is not really to make my dog sedate. Um, I want them still awake and alert and react, but able to respond and react to our wonderful stimuli. Um, and it's more, I want them to be able to cope with the things that are scary in the world. Our event medications should also do something similar. Sometimes though, they can be a little bit more sedating in the absence of the trigger is usually what happens. So for an example, again, nowadays with COVID that I've used often is, you know, maybe I gave my dog some medication, an event medication that is supposed to be given two hours prior to stressful things. So I know that I was going to have guests come over and I gave my dog my medication at four o'clock. And then 5.30 rolls around and my friend texts me and says, hey, you know, actually I tested positive for COVID. I probably shouldn't come over today. Fair, keep your germs to yourself. <laughs> um, but also I already gave my dog the medication, right? Um, and so I can't take that back. Just means that maybe she should take a really good nap um, for a few hours, still responsive, just a little bit more sleepy. Um, and then it'll wear off in that window of maybe eight to 12 hours, like we said. Um, I think side effects are also a big question that I get. Most commonly, it's GI related. So maybe a little bit of softer stool, um, suppression of appetite, meaning like they shouldn't completely hunger fast and stop eating it like completely. It, it maybe I don't eat as much or I don't finish my food. Or if I used to consistently be a twice a day eater, I go down to one. Um, so mild. Also, even the stool where a little bit of spit up should be mild, um, like not liquid diarrhea, but uh, softer stool that you could still pick up. It's just a little mushier, right? Um, and these effects should really only happen for the first few days, max two weeks after you either start a new medication or increase change a dose. So um, those are the most common things we see with our medications. Um, and that's speaking mostly for those daily medications. The event medications is that sedation, like I said, in the absence of the trigger. And then regarding safety, um, people are always concerned about that. Um, we can use these medications for the lifelong duration of a pet. Um, of course, we do ask for like annual blood work and um, we want to make sure that you're seeing your vet and, and that everything's going okay health-wise. Um, and mostly that's because our, our medications are metabolized by the organs in our body, like our kidney and liver. So if I see that um, all of a sudden we develop kidney disease just simply from age, okay, maybe we, we might want to just monitor is our behavior changing because our medications are metabolized by that organ. And if it's not functioning as well, then I might still have remnants of that medication in my body longer. Does that mean I need to adjust my dose at that point? And that might be a little bit lower. But if there's not a significant behavioral change, it's just like keeping note of the health of my dog. I have not really seen commonly that all of a sudden medication causes um, disease to those organs. Hope that helps alleviate some questions and fears. <laughs> um, but I do also want to talk about other products out there that are to help with our dogs. So the one that you see on the left, uh, the orange box with the collar, that is called, well, it used to be called Adaptal, and you'll still see that on the box. Um, they have combined with the company that creates those um, Thunder shirts. So now they've rebranded everything to be called Thunder Ease. Um, and so the product of the active ingredient is still the same. Um, it is DAP, which is our dog appeasing pheromone. That's the pheromone that our mama dogs produce between our mammary glands that produces that like more calming property. Um, that's more like affiliative. Like we don't want our puppies to come together to those mammary glands and then start like guarding um, to nurse. So it's essentially, hey, like we're all friends here. Um, let's share milk and all of that. So um, that's the essential messenger that the pheromone of DAP is sending to our dogs. Pheromones, if you'll remember, are species specific. So I can have a pheromone for my dog and my cat in the same space because the one for my dog is not going to affect the one to my cat and the cat vice versa. And then people <laughs> will not be affected either. Um, regarding the color, it does activate with body heat and takes about 72 hours to take effect. So um, 
that's the color for Thunder Ease. Um, Xenodog is a newer product that its active ingredient is still also DAP. Um, but this one, um, if you can see the like little canister, I equate it to those like um, air fresheners where you like open the top aluminum part and underneath there's all these like little gel like um circles um so that's the same you'll see similarly in there and then you just put that brown part back on this is a gel diffuser so adaptal slash thunder ease also creates a diffuser product but that one's a plug-in um, into an outlet so it's just a different option um and so the xenodog diffuser with the the gel also, I think that one lasts about two months in duration, whereas the diffuser for Thunder Ease Adaptable lasts about one month. So something to consider um, for pheromone product. And then our nutraceuticals. So a nutraceutical by definition is derived from food products. So the one that you see on the left is called Zilkeen. That one is made of a protein derived from milk. Um, and that is alpha-cazozapine is that ingredient that we're looking for. It binds to the same receptors in the brain as benzodiazepine. And so it can cause that calming relaxation, but without the sedation effect. Um, and so um, that is Zilkeen. It comes in a capsule and they do have like different sizes. As you can see for our different weight categories for our dogs, you can give it as the whole capsule or open it and you know, sprinkle that powder onto their food. Um, I don't feel like I've heard a lot of feedback that like dogs all of a sudden stop eating because the powder's on there. So um, consider that as a more like natural product. And then Anxetane um, is the one on the right. So that one, its active ingredient is L-theanine, which is the same um, active like amino acid in green tea, uh, when you've heard of people drinking green tea to like help calm them. Um, basically, it increases our GABA concentration and GABA is our inhibitory neurotransmitter, meaning that it dampens our anxiety responses. Um, so that's how uh, anxetine works. Um, I also get a question quite commonly because there's other products out there, um, uh, such as Composure Pro, which is also is L-theanine. Um, we've found though that the palatability seems to be more significantly increased with our anxetine and, um, L-theanine is not shelf stable for very long. So it should really be in these like blister pouches, like those foil ones that you open. Um, so that's what you'll see for anxetine, but for composure, it's in a pouch. So it makes me question a little bit like, okay, is that still a stable product um, that we can give to our dogs? Um, and then lastly, L-theanine truly um, should be a twice a day supplement that you can provide. Um, and the others are labeled as once a day. So I do think that Anxetane might be our better trusted um, product. Right. Uh, we can, we can't leave without talking about diet and nutrition. Of course, we want to find one that's balanced and high quality for our dogs. Um, we also want a, the protein content to be less than 28%. And um, you can find that on, on the on the bags. So you want to look for that protein content to be 28% or less. And we want to include grains. Um, a big problem we've had in the veterinary industry recent years is that all these like boutique grain-free foods have been coming out of the market. And um a lot of dogs who have dietary sensitivities are not actually sensitive to the protein, uh, excuse me, the grain content. It's they, um, so therefore we actually know that their, the protein content, the meat protein content is usually what they're sensitive to, like your chicken, pork, beef, those types of things. So a lot of times if I have a really itchy dog or a dog that um, has dietary sensitivity suspicion, um, my first go-tos are like, can we give you a hydrolyzed protein diet or a novel protein diet? It's not really to take away the grains. Um, and then in the more negative aspect, we have found more and more and more incidences of cardiac disease, the heart getting bigger in in these dogs that are on grain-free foods. So my take is if it's not really the grain they're technically allergic to and it could cause heart disease, let's get them on a diet that naturally includes grains in it already. 
Now, the two products that you're seeing there, the bag that has like that purple trim on the left is produced by Roto Canaan, um, and it is called the Calm <laughs> Diet. Um, it contains alpha cazozapine, which is, if you remember, the ingredient in Zilkeen, um, and it has higher levels of tryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin, and that's what helps us cope and feel calmer. So um, that is a product that we would consider, and if you'll look on the bag, it looks like a smaller breed type dog. Um, and that's probably on purpose because this this um, food does have a weight limit. So we want to use this for our, our smaller size dogs around like 20 pounds or lower. Um, NeuroCare is the diet that's on the right hand side, that black bag. Um, instead of using glucose, this diet actually uses medium chain triglycerides. So um, Dr. Pike commonly calls it like the ketogenic diet. Um, and the reason that Purina decided to do this is because we know that as we age, people alike, um, we're not as good at using glucose for our energy source. And therefore, um, we're trying to help our brains in that manner. Now, we do recognize that medium chain triglycerides, which they use for this diet, can be bitter. <laughs> um, so there's another diet called Bright Minds that has a lower percentage of it. Um, and so that might be a consideration if you try this NeuroCare and your dog decides not to eat it, then you might want to consider Bright Minds instead. Uh, and next is probiotics. So we know that there is definitely a connection between our gut and our brain, right? Everyone knows this at this point. And um, therefore, it makes sense that if we have a dog that is having um, chronic GI signs, first, again, talk to your veterinarian and work it up medically. But if we're going to add probiotics to promote their gut health, we can also consider what's called calming care. It's um, a probiotic created by Purina that comes in um, like packets and you rip open the top and like pour it on your dog's food. Um, it is, uh, excuse me, it is flavored. Um, so our dogs tend to love it. Um, and it is a hydrolyzed protein flavoring. So um, even if your dog is on a, a like a diet sensitive uh, food, then you can use it with your dogs. Um, the ingredient that is different in this probiotic product compared to Purina's other probiotic product, and which is called Fortiflora, is the active ingredient of Bifidobacterium longum. So if you'll see um, in that upper right corner of the box, um, it says BL999. Um, and that product, there was a pet behavior researcher who reported that dogs who took this um, were less likely to bark and jump and spin and pace in situations that normally would have caused them distress. Um, so that therefore we want to consider as like a whole um, aspect of helping promote calming for our dogs. And um, you might also consider this one specifically if you have a dog um, who really struggles with like boarding <laughs> situations. Um, it, it can definitely work well for those dogs who like start to have those GI signs when you're gone and you know the situations have changed. Um, it does take time though for the you know bacteria to colonize in the gut. Um, and so we want to at least start it one week before your trip, continue through the boarding situation time, and then even a few days after your return. So something to consider if your dog always has the runs when you're not there. And then we're going to talk about medication. So um, the products that I've included photos of here are called Clomacom and Reconcile. Um, the reason I only included them, even though we do use everything under the sun um, at this point, <laughs> is because these are our FDA approved medications for our canine patients. They're both labeled use R4 separation anxiety. Um, we tend to find that reconcile is better tolerated just like from a side effect profile. So um, that's the one we reach for most commonly. But sometimes we do still go back to Comacom. That one can be a little bit more pricey, especially if you have a larger dog. Um, but those are our products that we may consider regarding like true medication. Um, again, it can take several weeks for these medications to really start showing their beneficial effects. Um, so keep that in mind if you're um, thinking about that, or if your vet prescribes that for you, don't give up <laughs> after the first like week or two, like keep trucking along if you can. Um, 
then the next medication type are those events like we talked about. Um, so again, these are for those situations that aren't every day, like maybe your thunderstorms or your grooming appointments. Um, the product that you see there is called Cilio. Um, it is a gel product. So you'll see that little uh, tube. You can turn the dots um, to, based on the chart with how much your dog weighs and then push and it'll dispense a certain amount of gel and you rub that on the gum, like the inside gum of your dog. Um, and the reason I like this product, especially for our thunderstorm dogs, not only is it because that's what it's labeled for, um, but because it's onset of action is so much faster than a lot of our other event medications. Um, Cause I also will commonly hear like, well, you know, my dog is really scared of thunderstorms. So my vet prescribed me trazodone or my vet prescribed me, you know, Alprazolam or something like that. And then they're like, but it takes so long. And sometimes the storms come up and I, by the time the medication starts working, the storm has already passed. And now I'm just left with a dog who's kind of more sleepy during the day. So, um, you know, I don't love to hear that, but uh, Cilio can start working much faster and you can redose it um, about every two hours, maximum five times in that 24 hour period. So that I think is a, um, a good product if your dog is struggling with those thunderstorms or sudden noises. Um, the other ones that we, prescribed commonly are like trazodone, gabapentin, clonidine, like that combination we use a lot for like veterinary visits or even just alone. Um, for instance, my dog was really struggling with her walks. She became really scared of thresholds, doorways going outside. Um, and she was just so scared and she shut down and normally inside at home, she was fine. So I gave her clonidine. Now it does take about 90 minutes to take effect. So I timed it before her walks. Um, and the first dose that I gave her, because I started off a little low, um, she kind of just was like, oh, you were you were there the whole time? <laughs> I didn't realize you were there because I was so scared in my mind. Um, and then eventually um, I, I upped the dose just a little bit. And then she was like, oh, you're here and you have wonderful hot dog? Well, great. Um, and then I was finally able to make progress with our behavior modification training. Um, and so that's where event medication might be helpful for you. Um, and then the, I do want to end with like our action steps. So I know that it was a lot of information. <laughs> um, and so we want to think about what can I do with all of this? So now we understood like there's all these factors as to why my dog may be the way he or she is. And, um, you know, definitely, you know, you can do more research into that. But um, really biggest things, let's try to identify those triggers and those patterns. Is it always in the evening? Is it always in the morning? Is it always when I go reach for my jacket? Or um, is there a certain truck that my dog does not like? Um, you want to think about identifying those because that's how we can implement our management strategies. If I know what my dog is reacting to, I can adjust for that. And then seeking a qualified trainer who, um, you know, can really help me address the underlying emotion regarding those triggers, right? So remember, there's a chart upcoming, and then seeking a veterinary professional. Um, and that could be your general practitioner to start with those, you know, medical rule outs. And then if they, you know, refer you or you feel like you want a little extra help because your dog needs it, and you're thinking about maybe a daily or event medication protocol, then um, seeking out the nearest veterinary behaviorist. Um, I will say that you know, I know there's not a lot <laughs> out there, um, but there are some states where you can actually do everything fully remote. Um, so um, I can kind of try to put together that list and maybe give it over to Deborah so that you have access to which behaviorists um, can fully practice remotely. So I think that's it for our action steps. And this is that chart that I promised you with all those um, little acronyms and what they really mean um, so that you can start to really assess when you look at a trainer, do they have the appropriate training and methods to help your dog in a way that's going to be good for you and, and for your dog. So I think that's about it. That all I have. Um, I'll leave it open for questions and let's see if I can get back to, hang on, let me go back to the slide. Thank you very Keep much. Going. And thank you for sending the information that you're going to send. Um, <laughs> 
we send a follower that has handouts as well as uh, a link to the video. Mm -hmm. So we can probably include that. I'd like to include this trainer credentials too. I've never seen it laid out that well. Yeah. I um, loved it if when you I found could it. And <laughs> that uh, yeah. that would be great. So send that too. Um, okay. Dr. Learn has been very active <laughs> and I've been trying to keep up making copies of the questions and answers so that uh, we can send that out as well. Um, and my dog's starting to bark. So Dr. Lerner, there are other questions. Mm -hmm. that you there are a few that I did not get to. And so I saved them <laughs> for Dr. Eng. And so if it's okay, we'll go through those now. And, and if she has any questions, then I can chime in too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hold Sounds on. There's good. a new message. Let me just double check. Oh, yep. There's another one. Let me just copy this one and I'll add it to my list. Thank you, Dr. Lurie. You're being so like organized with all this. <laughs> There's a good chance that they will keep coming I know, in I know. until the last possible second. <laughs> when you start to say goodbye, thank you everyone for coming. Yeah. Suddenly five will show up. So yes, just absolutely. Clear. So I'll start with there were two that were very similar. So mm -hmm. if it's okay, I'll read both of them before you answer. Um, sure. And then there's a chance that one of the question askers has to give us a little bit more information to make sure that we are providing everything that they wanted. Um, but the first question is, what about Soliquin compared to Anxetane? And so the differences between those products. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was simply, is Soliquin a good option? Oh. But I wasn't sure it, what they meant option for what, like in general or for a specific problem that they were dealing with. One of the things that I'll say is I didn't mean that any of these other products are necessarily bad. Um, I think, you know, they, they have good ingredients. Um, it's just like Soliquin um, also is labeled for um, like per day, once a day use. And so um, like we discussed with the Anxetane, it should truly be like L-theanine should be a twice a day dosing supplement. And so that's the one thing that I'd be like, mm, like, okay, if you're labeling your chart as once a day, then how much do I give for twice a day? You know, so um, just so that I know that I'm giving it based on the manufacturer's recommendation it makes me feel more at ease if I'm using one that's labeled for twice a day. Good. And I'll just add to that. There are several different supplement types of products and, and medications that are labeled in a certain way with a certain regimen or dosing instructions that are not always what we clinically use based on more current research. And mm -hmm. so sometimes people would get caught up and say, I bought this product. This is what I'm using. And I'll say, oh, I think we want to change that a little bit. But no, that's what's on the package. And I respect that. But sometimes over time, we find that different things work a little bit differently. And then there are even studies to, to show that we can change some of those things around. All right. So then, so, so then I was waiting for the next thing to happen. That's me. <laughs> <Not like that. laughs> so the next question is, yeah. do you recommend any over-the-counter or prescribed CBD products for anxiety? Uh, oh, yeah. That's a yeah. tricky one. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, that that question comes up often and, and CBD, I'm sure everyone's familiar, is not regulated, right? Like there's no one going around and checking like, it, you know, what is in this product? It might say it has so many milligrams of the active ingredient, but is that real? And what else is in, in that product? There's no one going to test them. Um, so that for me is a little bit tricky. Um, the company that I've always recommended is called my mind is blanking. Elevet, excuse me. Yes, Elevet. Um, so I always said it like, it's like Ellen without the N, <laughs> like E-L-L-E -L -L -E vet. Um, the reason that I trust this product the best, despite the fact that it's an unregulated product for CBD, um, is that they actually took the time, effort, and money <laughs> um, to do research with Cornell's vet school. Um, the purpose of that research was really looking at like 
orthopedic like osteoarthritis pain management and they're really like the ones who created that first peer-reviewed journal article that gave you an actual dose <laughs> um, to use for that purpose. And so to me, like if a, if a company goes that extra mile to do that and gave us our first ideas of like, how do we start using this for our canine patients? Then that's the one that I'm going to recommend for people. So Elevet is the one that I like the most for that reason. Dr. Learn, do you have I know there's like one or two others that Dr. Pike also tends to like. So um, is there, do you know the other two that she, she likes? I'm not sure which one she likes. I do mm -hmm. use Elevate. Well, I, I don't often use CBD at, at all for behavioral specific problems. Mm -hmm. I use Elevate as a CBD product for some of my patients who are also suffering from seizure problems or um, pain mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. problems and then can help their behavior because we're addressing those underlying things, like we said <laughs> during your lecture. Um, and the other one that I use is veterinary solutions, veterinary required, re veterinary <laughs> formulated <laughs> solutions. <laughs> no, I don't remember the name. I will try to look at that and come back to you. <laughs> but those are the ones that I will use. Um, Okay, so next one is uh, kind of a, a vignette. My dog gets anxious or nippy when meeting new larger dogs, but she mm -hmm. starts out acting like she wants to meet them and may even pull on her leash to approach them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it works out fine and she ends up making a new friend. Any suggestions for interpreting these kinds of mixed signals or reactions, because I guess it's sometimes she is not happy about that situation. Mm, yeah, I think that's really tricky. That's hard when like, I know that we want our dogs to be able to make friends and all of that. My general go to rule, though, is that I don't let my dog meet other dogs on leash like that, that the reason for that is because um, they, you know, any animal, whether you're very excited and aroused, like your dog may be, or they're a little bit more like uncertain about the situation. And um, usually when you're getting into that emotional state, you got those big things that most people know, like that fight or flight response, right? Um, and so when I have the leash on, though, I've taken away the flight aspect. So I might be so in that instance, it sounds like the dog is actually really excited and aroused to like meet those other dogs but then um so again examples that i use in my own personal life i'm scared of heights but i like roller coasters so i you know always would be super excited and aroused to be like okay we're gonna do this we're gonna go on king to ka and i'm gonna go and i'm like the whole weight and everything i'm so excited I get on the ride and then the whole like going up um, process, I'm like, oh no, what what did I do? Like I didn't, this is not, oh, oh gosh, it's, you know, and so like, yes, initially it's a it's a happy, like, oh gosh, this is exciting, but then you're like, oh crap, never mind, that's not what I meant. Um, and that can be really hard um, for our dogs too, because they don't have that ability to say like, I can control this. I'm on a walk. I'm on a leash. I don't have an escape. Um, and so my general rule is, you know, try to avoid it as much as we can. If it means that my dog needs to actually meet certain dogs in like a safe environment that's fenced or, um, with dogs that I know that I can trust to like react appropriately, that's usually the better option. Um, and so, and sometimes that like initial like hi can be a little bit overcompensating, right? Like I'm actually a little bit uh, anxious, but I'm going to be overly like acting like I'm okay. <laughs> um, like you might when you're nervous for your first job, but you go and like do all these things that you normally wouldn't have done <laughs> as in your day to day. Um, so again, I, I usually say, hey, let's try to stay away from that situation as much as we can. Um, but if you can read that body language and the earlier you start to sense, are we passing that threshold of I'm excited into, oh, I can't deal with this anymore and adjusting and managing that, whether that's walking away, hey, nice to meet you, sorry, we're gonna run. Um, or um, if you know, you're able to just make that U-turn before you ever get there, that, that's, that's preferred. Um, so, and we know it, it, it can't be for every situation, um, but that's our general. 
general rule answer. Any extra tips or thoughts, Dr. Lauren, that you want to add to that specific vignette scenario? <laughs> yeah, no, I think you answered it really well, especially with that roller coaster you know, analogy. <laughs> that makes total sense to me. And I feel like that's understandable um, for everybody can kind of sympathize with that excitement. And then, oh, no, that was the bad <laughs> choice. I got in too deep. Get me off right now. And yeah. For our dogs, they can't get off the ride, right? They're there. They already right. got too close. And then sometimes that's like, <gasps> and then the other dog's okay. like, no, and <laughs> chaos happens. Yeah, I like Lisa's like a blind date yeah. <laughs> comment. That's right. that's true. You're like, oh, okay. This is not. Oh, that's I my table. Getting... I'm yeah. just going to keep going. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye. See you. Bye. <laughs> Oh that's a All tough right. world <laughs> yes it is so the next one is um more of a food and and kind of medications kind of question so mm -hmm. foods with tryptophan the precursor to serotonin mm -hmm. is there a possibility of serotonin syndrome if a dog is also mm -hmm. on a serotonergic medication like fluoxetine hmm i honestly don't have a specific answer for that. I think that I would be more cautious um, in monitoring for that. I, I can definitely, I would defer to Dr. Lauren actually to help with like the really pathophys behind all of that. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I think when I talk about diets and, and supplements, those are typically those dogs who might not quite need medication yet. So we're using those precursors and, you know, more natural products to hopefully manage it before we get to the point of needing medication. And then if we've tried that and yet we're still struggling, then it's okay. Maybe we just need to actually be on a psychotropic medication. Um, so I think that's how I would look at it. The actual specific, can we have more serotonin syndrome? I think the general like scientific answer would be yes. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Learn, because we are creating more precursor to serotonin. But I think also with serotonin syndrome, it's very specific to a dog and also a product. So um, one dog may have serotonin syndrome on one SSRI, like reconcile, and then we switch them over to a different SSRI, same type and mechanism of action of medication. And yet they have, they don't go through serotonin syndrome and it's very dog dependent. Um, I use like antibiotics and pain medications as a good analogy for that. Like I, again, with my chronic migraines, I am a, I need four ibuprofen kind of girl. <laughs> Whereas my husband is like, I just need two and I'm good. Um, so that is where I would go. But again, I appreciate your thoughts, Dr. Learn, if you want to comment further. Yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, I think the first point, like Dr. Yang said, is that um, typically when I'm using those medica those foods, um, it is a more mild case. It's a dog that may not actually need a medication. And so we're starting to kind of give them a little oomph, a little help in where they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And then if for some reason we do need to transition that dog to medications or something has changed or so forth, and we add a serotonergic medication, when I say serotonergic, that just means a medication that raises serotonin levels. And there are lots of different kinds of them, um, but that would be the risk factor for serotonin syndrome. Um, so if I'm transitioning that animal over, I don't necessarily have to stop the food that they're on, um, but I potentially could be more cautious because now we're doing multiple different things to raise those serotonin levels. And when those serotonin levels get too high, that's when you have that risk of serotonin syndrome. Yeah. Um, you can do that with lots of different things, meaning multiple medications, medications and food, uh, supplements and medications, or any of those combinations and variations in there. Um, to be fair, I do want to say that it is not a common thing that happens. I have many dogs that are, are on tryptophan and two different serotonergic medications, and they yeah. are still fine without having any signs. In my entire career of being a veterinarian, which has been 20 plus years, I've seen one dog that had serotonin syndrome, and that wasn't even um, during my behavior um, career. And so, <laughs> yeah. so I think that it is something that we always want to think about, but, but one of my mentors, Dr. Radasta actually said to me that tryptophan supplementation, um, is, can be hard to get higher levels of serotonin 
because mm-hmm. tryptophan is like a uh, kid getting on the bus to a field trip, right? Like you're getting all these kids on the bus and that bus has to go to the field trip, meaning that bus has to cr- cross the barrier to the brain and everybody's competing to get on the bus. And some things are uh, able to get on the bus more efficiently than tryptophan. <laughs> and so tryptophan might be left behind. And so I mm-hmm. think that you know those levels aren't always metabolized in a way that we dramatically change the levels in the brain, especially if we're talking about enough to get to a serotonin syndrome situation. So hopefully that answered all the questions with even more information than you really wanted to hear. <laughs> Sometimes we get into our little doctory, like, oh, nerdy, we love these things <laughs> situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, Deborah actually, I think it just put in the chat. So what did she say? And then someone else asked her, you know, did you my mouse? She said, can you explain what serotonin sy- <laughs> keeps moving? Uh, can you explain what serotonin syndrome is for those who may not know this term? That's a great question because we just talked at length about it without even saying what it was. So it is a it is a whole it, when we say syndrome, those are a whole spectrum of things that can happen. But essentially, the most common behavior that we see when it comes to serotonin syndrome is like a very mild head tremor. So the, the head goes like kind of just like back and forth a little bit, like side to side. Um, I, again, I love analogies. So um, like uh, if you've ever met like a Parkinsonian patient who like just has that little bit at their head, um, that's what it can look like. That's our, our most common um, like reaction that we can see. And, and it is called serotonin syndrome because it's from too much serotonin in your body. Um, so I hope that helped to answer that. So there are a couple more questions. And so if anybody needs clarification, chime in, but I want to make sure that we get to some of these other things that are out here. Um, let's see, we did the serotonin center. So the next one is how important is it to understand the nature or genesis of a dog's reactivity in order to take action? Hmm. I think it, it can help us in that. There are certain medications we might use more for like dogs who have noise phobias and are more of like the shy and retreat type of dogs. So it's more so like the behavior that they're exhibiting, which I can sometimes start to parse out more by like understanding like how did this come about? Like how did this happen? Um, and so it like, for instance, I see those really shut down, like dart and retreat kind of dogs who have issues, like a lot of those like street dogs that we're seeing coming from like international rescue situations. Um, And so that type of dog might need a little bit of a different medication profile than a dog that is genuinely just like the, I'm in your face and I'm going to just always like be like right there and bark and lunge and try to bite. Like um, those are still both underlyingly from fear and anxiety, but we're exhibiting the behavior in a different way. And many times the stories that I hear from um, how the dog came to be in this family, they can differ. Um, So in that way, it can be helpful. Um, At the end of the day, sometimes the medication that I thought was gonna be the right fit for this dog, might not. And that is, as you've seen probably in like human medic- medicine, um, it doesn't always go exactly the way that we thought it would. And sometimes there is just a little bit of trial and error. Um, but I hope that helped that it's, you know, it to a general degree, yes, it can help us understand the dog. Um, and so that can indicate and help guide our first choices and what we may reach for, um, for treatment options. Um, but in the overall grand scheme of things, um, we'll, we'll probably, if you're at the point where you're seeking a veterinary behaviorist, it's still going to be management, medication, and behavioral modification. True story. All right. <laughs> next one is besides medication, what do you recommend for separation anxiety? We just came home in our new rescue tore apart a pillow, chewed through the computer wires, not sure what to do. The other dogs were little and we didn't have this problem. So I think when it comes to separation anxiety, um, I'm guessing this person is saying the dog is doing this when they're gone. 
um, is the <laughs> is the way that I would anticipate that because we do sometimes have to parse out like is it actually just the dog does it all the time, right? Even regardless of whether you're home or not. Um, even when there's elimination problems, like we will ask like, well, do they pee every time you leave, no matter when you just let the dog out? Um, but they're fine when you're home. Um, those tend to be more in the separation anxiety category. I think separation anxiety, unfortunately, has become such an overused <laughs> term. Um, but that those dogs are like the truly I can't cope and I am just unable to deal with your departure. And by departure, that could be what we call like a true departure, like you're gone completely from the house or like a virtual departure. I just don't have access to you. You're in a different room or space. Um, so it sounds like this particular dog is doing a lot of like destructive behaviors, which is a, a you know, a behavior that comes out from separation anxiety. Um, I think I'd be curious to see like, okay, what are those factors surrounding, right? Remember we talked about, can we figure out, is it always the departure or do we do it anyways, regardless? Okay, maybe that's just a dog that needs to learn like, I have other options, other things that I could chew on that are okay and start to learn those just as we do with body training, right? Um, or is it, the fact that I actually am really anxious and I only do this when my people are not available, um, that dog will probably need more of an assessment um, from, you can start with your vet or, you know, a veterinary behaviorist. Um, hopefully, I think I lost track of where I was going with that. Uh, train yeah, but of I, I mean, I think that's appropriate, right? First, you have to make sure really that it is separation anxiety, mm -hmm. not boredom and not some type of environmental trigger, some other thing, because when you make a treatment plan, you want to know what you're treating for sure. And mm -hmm. then the other part of that is if it really is separation anxiety, then the same potentially medications, management, and behavior modification apply. And the management part is suspending absences. If that dog is panicking when you are gone, then we have to find a way that nobody leaves that dog alone for a period of time until we can help that dog learn to be comfortable being alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one is, uh, some, yes, for some adult dogs that go through foster and exhibit anxiety, do you think that a dog should be evaluated by a behaviorist uh, or veterinarian immediately, or will the anxiety lessen or go away if the dog is given some time to feel safe and adjust to the new environment and people? That is mm -hmm. tricky. Mm -hmm. That one is tricky, I think. Um, because there's a lot of factors with dogs who come into new homes, right? It does take time to adjust to that environment, the family and all of that and show like how they truly feel if they're comfortable enough to get there. Um, I think when we think about anxieties, though, um, we don't ever like cure anxiety and we don't grow out of them. We actually kind of grow more into them. Um, and so if you, I usually tell people like, you know, more than you think, trust your gut. If you're gut is like, hmm, I'm a little more worried about this guy than, than others that I've had. Go with it. Mention that to your veterinarian. Seek out a behaviorist. The sooner we start to help, the better. Because again, a part of management, like we said, is stopping the practice of that emotion and behavior. And the sooner we can do that, the better. Because again, it, I think of behavior as like a chronic disease, like diabetes, right? Like you're never going to cure that in someone similarly to behavior. We're going to manage with like diet and exercise, but you, you may need insulin, right? Like that. And that's medication is what I say mean may need for behavior cases. Um, but you don't ever go to a diabetic person and expect them to just get cured, right? Because you're giving them insulin and we're learning how to deal with and keep those, you know, episodes as minimal as possible. So yeah, the sooner we can get to it, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in a shelter rescue situation. Um, we don't know when that dog is going to be adopted. And even though there is a possibility that kind of the overall like panic of being in this new place comes mm -hmm. down a little bit, um, we want to make sure that we're helping that individual straight from the get-go, right? Even if some of that goes away, or maybe let's just pretend that it's all going to go away. And a couple of weeks, the dog's going to be totally fine. The first couple of weeks where it's not totally fine, we need to help that dog in those moments too. Yeah. 
All right. So then the next one is one of my dogs has stranger danger. Uh, our mm -hmm. sister can come and visit and our dog will seem to watch and guard and follow her around mm -hmm. barks when she reenters a room. How do we make our dog more comfortable with this kind of thing? Uh, so when it comes to stranger danger, a lot of times the way that you help manage it depends on the stranger. <laughs> so um, I think we put the onus on our dogs a lot, unfortunately, whether it's how they react to our children, like when we have new babies enter the family or a guest come over. But a lot of times it's because we have misread those early signs that our dogs are actually not as comfortable and we keep putting them in these positions. So um, I think there can be ways of management, and this is where a great qualified trainer should be able to help give you tips on like, what are some guest protocols that you can have in place when, you know, someone comes over? Um, I'm thinking that if, correct me, because I can't, I don't know where it is in the chat. Did we say that the dog is sometimes okay, but other times not? Is that, the, am I understanding the situation okay? Uh, it says that, um, the dog watches and guards the guest and follows them around and barks sometimes when uh, they re-enter the room. Okay. Yeah. So that all of those behaviors already told me that that dog's not comfortable uh, with that situation. And in behavior land, we define aggression as anything that increases distance from the thing I'm uncomfortable with. So even though we started with just, I'm going to be really aware of you and I'm going to stare at you, that is still technically aggression. I, I use this example for when people come to our clinic and I'm already usually in the room and, I, and they come to the doorway and I'm like, hi, nice to meet you. Welcome. Come have a seat. You know, and I introduce myself. But I tell them later, I'm like, when you first got here and you were standing in that doorway, if I just like stared at you, wouldn't you take like two steps back? Because <laughs> that's super awkward. Um, that fulfilled the purpose of me increasing the distance between myself and that person. So um, you're reading your dog correctly in that they're expressing behaviors that they're uncomfortable, the way you might adjust for that, like I said, depends on the person. So if that person is a very good, like I take instruction well, it may be that we just need to manage it by, okay, maybe we start with the dog in a separate area and then guest comes in, is already settled, sitting, and you give them very like detailed, well, not very specific instructions on, hey, I don't want you to talk to my dog. I don't want you to look at my dog. Even if she comes up to you, just talk to me, ignore the dog and and then let her investigate you. Because again, if I'm scared of this new uh, novel thing, I want to be able to like come up and see like, is this thing going to all of a sudden reach out for me and grab me? Or is it just going to behave normally? So giving the dog the opportunity to investigate and most importantly, not forcing an interaction. So our dogs don't unusually want touch. So I think that's super confusing, especially for our dog lovers, because we think like man's best friend and we cuddle and we snuggle and do all the things. And half the time, I think the dogs are just like, eh, I'm tolerating this. Um, so if the dog comes and is like actively seeking the attention of someone who's seated and acting calm, and they're like nudging their hand and doing all these things to say, I want like interaction, okay, maybe you can do just a little bit of pet stop and see if the dog continues to do that. That's called a consent test, right? And so you can try that versus if the dog just comes, sniffs a little bit, and then is like, I'm good. Just gonna, I saw you're, you're normal and I'm gonna go do my own thing now. We don't need to be like, okay, Fluffy, come on, come back. Like, you don't have to do that. Like the dog clearly said, shit, well, but I'll, I'll be over here, <laughs> you know, um, so respecting those lower level cues, um, again, just as this person has observed very accurately in their dog, respecting what those are, even after we try to do a little bit of introduction, I think is helpful. There's a lot to that conversation. So if it's that you would prefer to have an actual conversation and consultation, we're available. Um, but that's the hopefully shorter answer that might have helped. <laughs> good, good. 
good, good, good. All right. Next one is, do you know any negative side effects for clonidine? Uh, so I think um, with clonidine, um, people uh, have heard of it with like blood pressure um, issues, and we don't actually really see that with our dogs. So um, I commonly say to people, because I will give them a wide range of dosing appropriate for their dog's weight that I've calculated. Um, and then um, especially if they're already in like the medical field or they take it to their pharmacy and the pharmacist is like, whoa, what is this dose? Um, rest assured, like I have calculated it according to what a dog's metabolism should accept. Um, so they don't have the same blood pressure effects that um, we might encounter as people. Their dosages, like I said, are can be up to like 10 times what a human might take. So again, try not to get alarmed. And, and I usually you know, encourage people to start kind of at the lower end of the dosing spectrum and like work their way up gradually to see where is that happy place. Um, the other side effect profile that I hear more commonly is like changes in urination habits. So whether that's like, you know, peeing more often or, or things like that. Um, and then I actually personally in my dog, um, again, I was doing some half step increments and she was like really great at three tablets of clonidine. And I was like, maybe I can do another half step more. So then I gave her three and a half and all of the wonderful things like being calm and below threshold and like acknowledging my cues and all those things went out the window. She was like, zoomies. And I was like, okay, never again. <laughs> so sometimes like that hyperactivity paradoxical reaction could happen as well. Like those are, I feel like the more common side effects and questions that I get asked by veterinarians and, and from our lay people. So great question about that one. And then uh, the, sedation yep. in the absence of the trigger, right. as we said. <laughs> yeah. Because that's what we're using it for. Sometimes. Yes. Sometimes we purposely <laughs> want to take advantage of a little bit of extra sleepiness if we're going to go to the vet and have our nails trimmed, but right. that's another use for it. All right. This is the last one so far. Um, so uh, my dog is a rescue. She is triggered by children. Um, seeing them and or hearing them. She is taking fluoxetine. We cannot have our grandchild visit if a dog is if the dog is here. Is there anything we can do? Um, or should we continue to remove her if we know a visit is pending? Hmm. I love that you've already thought about, should we just give her her space? I think that is actually like, Again, I think a lot of times when we have this dream and hope and expectation of what we imagined for our dogs and our families and their interactions, and it doesn't quite turn out that way, it is okay to take a moment to like grieve that and say like, okay, maybe that's not what's going to be for my dog or for my family. Um, on the flip side, there is quite a range for fluoxetine. So um, happy to Dr. Learn, Dr. Pike and I, we take emails from general practitioners all the time um, about like, hey, I tried this dose of this medication for this dog. Where would you go from here? So you could consider, is it a dose that we need to adjust? Um, is it that maybe we need a different class of medication or even within the same class, a different drug that's more specific for your dog? Um, and then especially like those event medications, like we talked about that we give for those more stressful events. Cause like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm guessing that the grandchild is not coming like every single day and they are every moment of this dog's day. Um, so if it means we give a little extra something to help, cope with those stressful situations, I think that's okay. A really good resource that I'm sure that Deborah has probably referred to often is Family Paws. Um, so Family Paws is a website that you can go to and they have a lot of really great free resources on there. Um, and their whole mission and whole goal is to really help that, you know, time with dogs and how they live with younger children, every, everything from like infancy all the way, usually up to like that toddler type age. Um, and I actually listened to a webinar recently from the founder of Family Paws. And one great tip she said is like, also think about the developmental ages of each child and what changes happen there and adjust for it accordingly from the perspective of your dog and give the child also options that are acceptable alternatives. Um, like an example they used was if my dog is not comfortable with being pet, but child is like, I want to 
pet or if the dog is not comfortable with the child holding the leash because they're at that right face level um, and they're at that stage where they're like, I want to help. I want to help. I want to be a part of it. So I don't want to just tell the child like, no, you can't do that, you know, but like you can offer them an alternative of like you walk fluffy like your pet stuffy dog and we'll walk our real dog um, when they come visit or if it means that they're in a you know controlled setting like those baby gates like we talked about like managing and providing um, they call them success stations so that they can still be part of like the fact that there's a visit happening but just having that barrier there may mean that for the dog they feel more comfortable and so their threshold is a little little lower and also teaching all of our children like what is an appropriate way to interact with our dogs is a it's a really big thing so medication management and uh, behavior modification is essentially what it comes down to every time happy to chat more if, if needed so another friend chimed in and had kind of a jumping off of that we, mm. there's a, a similar kind of problem. We have separated our dog in another room or the basement when we've had company. Mm -hmm. However, when we separate this dog, she spends a lot of time crying and whining mm. and she wants to join in, but we bring her out. She's lunging at people. Mm -hmm. And that is a very common problem that we see. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think for dogs who are struggling with that, um, A, then the question is also, do we have appropriate medication protocol for when these visits are happening? And then maybe that dog's management, because if that medication protocol is appropriate and working well, then that separation and maybe long lasting enrichment toys and something to distract them. Remember, think about all those like stimuli of like the senses. I can't see them. What can I provide instead? Can you leave a TV on with like nature shows? <laughs> um, can I leave layers of sound? So like the, them hearing everyone laughing and having a good time up there, like they don't, you know, feel triggered by that. Some people even use um, those bumpers on the bottom of the, the door so that like it kind of helps block that noise even further. Um, so those are kind of management strategies in the home. Sometimes if medication and that management isn't enough, does it mean that we just have either a neighbor watch them at the neighbor's house or they get to go to doggy daycare if they're okay with other dogs? Um, because I think if they're at the point where their anxiety and their fear means it comes out as lunging to the new person, then that's not fair. That's not fair for the dog or for those people. We need to feel safe, right? So um, I don't think it's appropriate for that dog to meet those new people because clearly they've shown us like, I'm overwhelmed and I can't deal with this in another way. And so this dog might be more in the management side um, of other options. Um, where can I be elsewhere with enrichment and medication? Yeah, I love everything that you said. The only thing that I would chime in is kind of still backing up a little bit to figure out what that distress is. So obviously mm -hmm. we know they're having trouble being present with the guests. We separate them, which is an ideal you know, choice for management right. did not work in this case. But then when that dog is in that um, room separated or the basement or the room, why? Why are they crying and whining? Are they crying and whining because they are still upset because they hear, like you said, they hear the triggers that are upstairs. There are guests, there are evil monsters in the house. Um, <laughs> are they crying and whining because they actually have to go to the bathroom and somebody mm -hmm. forgot to let them outside before they shut them in that space. I don't think that's what you did, but you know, we want to know those answers. And then the last is, are they crying and whining because they want to be with their human family members, right, right. but unfortunately their human family members come with a side helping of monster guests right now. <laughs> and that's the struggle I think that you're probably dealing with. And so that then goes to what um, Dr. Eng said, as far as, is there a medication protocol that we need? Can they be separated with some white noise and some food puzzles and the things to keep them distracted? Um, we could potentially change the other room or basement into an X pen so that mm -hmm. they're with you in the room, but kind of as much distance as you can mm -hmm. find to keep them from those guests so that they are feeling a little bit safe and maybe even a visual barrier of a blanket over the side of the X pen so they can see you, but not the weird monsters. 
Um, in that way, you can also have them set up with a um, food puzzle or something like that. So those are, are certainly some options that you would want to think about in that, in that situation. I, I think one thing I wanted to add that I meant to mention in our presentation itself, but I don't think that I did, was even with these food puzzles, um, a lot of times people get frustrated because they're like, well, they told me to use a Kong or they told me to use a food puzzle. And then my dog like just looked at it and didn't do anything with it or it didn't work for my dog. She just flipped it over or whatever have you. There is a learning curve um, with food puzzles and different enrichment activities. Like you might need to work with them gradually to set up like how quickly can I, like how slowly, excuse me, do I need to, um, you know, make it easier and then gently like make it harder and harder. So it's more and more challenging and enriching for my dog because they get frustrated too. Um, again, I keep using my own, um, like I have an 11 month old son and we are um, subscribers of those love Everly boxes. And I got the toy where like, there's um, like a wooden portion and you have like these balls and you like stick it in the top hole and it comes out the other side. I, my son it was, was picking and doing things like very quick. So I just thought like, oh, look, there's a new really cool toy. I'm going to hand it to him. He might know how to do it. It actually took several months for him to figure out that I take the ball and I put it in the hole and I push it through the hole and it comes out and I can look at it and grab it. Like it took him, like he just got it. That's why I just thought of this example. But we got that from like the previous box, which was meant for, I think, like the nine, 10 month old crew. Um, and so everybody has a different learning curve, but also like, I kept showing him, like I kept showing him me doing it and we worked with the ball alone. Like we kind of broke it down further and further to say like, hey, there's this actually really cool thing that you can do here um, before he was just throwing the ball <laughs> um, and rolling the ball. But um, we kept interacting with it to say like, look at this thing that like you could do. Now he's like, Ooh, look at, you know, so he'll, he'll use it. But um, I thought of that and I was like, wow, how many times have I thought like I bought something for my dog and I was like, it's going to be amazing. And I gave it to her, but I didn't take the time to like really like work with her and show her how it works. And then I just got frustrated and I was like, stupid Amazon, I spent all this money and it didn't work the way I wanted it to. Um, so same thing, you know, give your dogs a chance to learn it. And then we can use it for those times when we need more enrichment, whether it's when you're out of the house or when we're in these challenging situations. Mm -hmm. And there are two questions that actually go right with what you just said. Oh. <laughs> um, I know that's, that's just, we're learning all kinds of cool things and it brings up other thoughts. So one of them is um, for the dog that is um, lunging at guests um, but also um, can't be separated. Uh, would a piece of the dog's significant person's clothing with a scent or something scented like them be uh, help that um, being in the room with them or even one of their dog friends being with them or something that smells like one of their dog friends? I think that that question really depends on the dog and it might be tricky, which is why this may actually be like, we need to have a bigger discussion than just the Q and A section of this <laughs> webinar. But my short answer would be, I don't know that that dog is under threshold enough that giving them just that one scented thing will be sufficient. So again, analogy, if I'm sitting at the edge of the Grand Canyon and I'm scared of heights, and someone's like, it's okay, I'll stand there with you. Okay, great. I'm glad you're going to stand there with me. But that didn't change how I felt about the fact that I'm at the edge of the Grand Canyon, right? Same thing with like treats or things like, all right, I'll walk along the trail and I'll pick up the $100 bills, but I'm still not comfortable. And I use that because the fact that we're overly like reacting to the situation means like, I'm past that level. I can't like, sure, it's great to, and I think sometimes we have to think about, again, from the animal's perspective, like, it feels better for us, because we're like, oh, we've given them a stuffy, and we've given them something that smells like us, maybe it'll make them feel better. And again, when they're under threshold, maybe that might be possible. But if they're already at the place where they're just like, panicking, and I would need to be with you. And if not, I'm going to lunge like that is already a sign that we're way past and we need more than 
than just my friend sitting next to me to say, hey, girl, it's okay. <laughs> like, I need someone to be like, let's adjust the situation and move five steps back. Right. Yeah. And don't pat me on the back to comfort me because I'm going <laughs> to fall over the precipice. <laughs> right. Right. Because like if someone, oh yeah, if I was at the edge of that cliff and someone was like, Esther, it's okay. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I thought you were going to push me over the edge. Like that's the last time I need someone to pet me about that. So yep, um, yep. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so then you had just talked a lot about puzzle toys, right. And mm-hmm. spending all your money on Amazon. And so um <laughs> One other guest said, could food puzzles cause anxiety? My dog loves them, but gets really hyper-focused and then Mm. be protective of the puzzle. And so he doesn't get food puzzles anymore. Ah, okay. So hmm. that one, I think also we need to then have a further discussion of, is this actually a resource guarding dog? Um, and therefore we need to figure out instead of just as soon as that toy is done, we reach for it in the dog's presence. Like when we manage resource guarding dogs, we want to like make sure that they're far, far away from the thing we're going to pick up. You then for that dog to manage, it might mean we have to choose items that we know the dog is not going to ingest, whether it's the plastic of the toy itself or however happens. Um, again, I know it seems very repetitive, but if that dog is to the point <laughs> where they're overly aroused, that means medication is, is where you need extra help um, because that medication needs to bring that arousal level down so that we're at our space where I can cope and just focus on the toy and not get like overly so into it. Um, so I think that's where I would think about for that dog. Yeah, the only other thing I would say is because we just don't know everything about this dog, right? I I Mm -hmm. think all of our answers are kind of based on the information we're given, but (laughs) you have to recognize that neither one of us have ever seen any of the friends that were described in these little vignettes. So we don't really truly know the exact answer for you, um, but we're kind of basing that on what our experience has told us. Um, If this friend is just really frustrated Like, for instance, like Dr. Eng said, like that her dog did not know how to do it. And so it was Mm -hmm. frustrating, couldn't figure it out. And so then this dog could be hyper focused, like this, this specific puzzle is too hard for me. I can't figure it out. I'm really Mm -hmm. mad. Like I'm shaking it around. Like I can't, (laughs) like, where's my reward? Mm -hmm. And so it could be that we have to start with an easier version of a puzzle toy to kind of get some of those thoughts moving and problem solving skills happening. And, um, and that frustration could lend itself to being protective too, because you're just, now you're done. You're like, I'm frustrated. Right. There's food in there. I can't get it, but nobody mm-hmm. else is going to get it and I'll fight you for it. And so we, we really have to kind of back up and say, what are the contributing factors that are causing mm-hmm. some of these things? And can we make it easier? Can we simplify things? How do we help you emotionally? And then you can be more successful. And, and it's not wrong to take all the puzzles away if you're guarding puzzles, But that may not be the necessary solution if we can find some other things that can help that pet. Because I do really like mental stimulation and enrichment to get those brains working. Um, Sometimes if I have a dog that just destroys everything, then I'll give them stuff to destroy. Like Mm -hmm. a uh, cereal box stuffed with some newspaper and some kibble. Like pull it apart. Go for it. Destroy it all up and then... (laughs) I'll let you outside in the backyard and then I'll clean up the mess. Yeah. 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 Get them away first. You destroy it Um, because it's fun. Yeah. My other thought is like, um, you know, if it's too easy, like the dogs already figured it out and then like, uh, not to brag, but I was one of those like students who like in elementary school, like I'd be like, and I'm done. And I'm like, like I'm ready for the next thing. Um, and, and so like in those cases, does that mean we need a different puzzle that we can adjust the difficulty level and make it challenging? Sometimes that stretches your brain <laughs> um, to like find and make ways to make it more challenging for my dog. Um, and sometimes maybe puzzles truly aren't the thing that's most enriching for them, right? Like, is it we should instead give them like nose work that we set up around the house or um does that dog truly need just like maybe two laps around the neighborhood and then they come in and then work on the puzzle toy um sometimes that is helpful too so um by no means am i saying like exercise is gonna be the end-all be-all of our anxiety because 
it's usually the anxiety is causing the energy. <laughs> um, but if it's a young dog who like just was inside all morning and I just wanted to go for a little jog and then I am able to focus more, that might be a, a, a consideration too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 good. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's all the questions that I have seen come through the chat. Awesome. And we are just seven minutes before our time. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank both of you. This was pretty incredible having two of you here. And um, I, I tried to get a lot of Dr. Learn's answers onto a Word document that I will try to turn into something that I can attach to the follow-up. Um, anyway, I, there are more questions that are constantly coming in, but, uh, you know, you can't get to everything. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, I guess that is it for now. Um, if you want to take a few minutes, you can look at the chat and see what people are thanking you for. Aww. Very complimentary. I, I do want to say thank you for the opportunity to, you know, speak and um, Dr. Learn and myself and everyone at the Animal Behavior Wellness Center. We really do appreciate everything, Deborah, that you have done. And I know that the rest of your crew are going to continue to do. I think it's uh, refreshing to have a trusted resource. And we refer to you guys as like a, a place to go to for good information all the time. So thank you for um, giving me the opportunity and, and for providing that for all of our dog loving family. Oh, thank you. That's really <laughs> good to hear. Okay. I guess that is it. And um, bye guys. And thanks Dr. Learn. <laughs> yeah, you were a great addition. Bye everyone. <laughs>